Welcome and thank you for joining us. It's Monday, August 12th. You're watching News 2 on VIA Channel 4 and 504. I'm Allison Bornvenac filling in for Leslie Comision. Topping our stories tonight, a group undertaking various service projects in over 18 U.S. cities is helping serve at food banks, homes for the elderly, homeless shelters, as well as shelters for animals. The organization provides life coaching, academic tutoring, community service, and cultural programs to its participants. But most of all, the program founder says she takes a holistic approach on what best supports and empowers participants. Here's more. Bring it in, bring it in, teamwork, oh, teamwork. Bring it in. Yeah, bring oh, it in, bring, bring it in. in. A youth development organization providing tools and support to at-risk youth to live happier, healthier lives is driving across America on a summer of service road trip. And we started out in New York and we're going to end in California and it's 14 states that we're going to 18 cities. And every other state that we stop in, we're doing community service projects. Risa O'Reilly started Project Promise in 2012. Along with volunteers, Risa designed the youth program to supplement classroom instruction to help students achieve grade level proficiency in reading and math, provide creative expression, cultural awareness, and family services. After a year of planning along with student and parent fundraising and sponsorship, several group members known as Caterpillars are committing to service before self. The first we stopped in New York and we rehabbed their community garden at Union Settlement in East Harlem. And then two days later, we did a project in Ohio where we worked with Life Care Alliance and we packed meals for their Meals All Wheels program. When we moved over to Chicago, we worked at the Claire Howe Senior Living Apartment, where we socialized and gardened with seniors there. And just yesterday, we did a fourth project in Memphis, Tennessee, where we supply don't, um, desserts, school supplies, and toys for the families that live in a, a homeless shelter. There are nine components in the Project Promise program that aims to provide long-term success of each participant. The summer trip expands on strengthening character and showing caterpillars how to channel their energies towards a positive and constructive life, along with being good community members. Caterpillars, Risa says she's always had a passion to engage youths. Even when she endured a setback in life, she used the occasion to open doors for others. I still have it that I was laid off back in 2012. And it came to me and said, you know what, this is my opportunity. This is my opportunity to create a program that I felt would be most impactful for the youth in our community. And our Caterpillar Project does just that it's a holistic approach program that impacts and empowers the whole child. Risa says she hopes that the trip reinforces to program participants that though they are from a small island, they are part of a larger community. For News 2, I'm Stephanie Shalana Brown. Project Promise also hosts the Every Kid in a Park program, which offers every public school fourth grade student the opportunity to visit and learn about the Salt River and explore Taino culture by viewing artifacts. The VI Housing Finance Authority Executive Director Daryl Griffith is urging homeowners to apply soon for the Envision Tomorrow program. It's the new federally funded home repair program that many consider the second phase of the emergency recovery for hurricane-stricken homeowners. The program is funded by Housing and Urban Development to the tune of $200 million for the home repairs category alone. It will serve homeowners who fell through the cracks during the FEMA-funded STEP program, or sheltering and temporary emergency power. Housing finance cannot put a number on how many homes Envision Tomorrow will repair because it all depends on how many homeowners apply and how much the damage to their homes will cost to repair. That's why Griffith is urging homeowners to apply as soon as possible because it's a first come, first serve system. There will also be some accommodations to homeowners with severely damaged homes. They can potentially be bumped to the top of the list. For more information, you can go to www.
www.vistormrecovery.com. Again, that website is www.vistormrecovery.com. Meanwhile, Schneider Regional Medical Center is urging the community needing medical attention to go to their private physicians first before going to Schneider's emergency, emergency room. According to Schneider CEO Bernard Wheatley, the emergency department will be undergoing repairs. That began on Friday, August 9th, and will continue until Monday, August 19th. Until that time, the hospital is expecting interruptions that may increase wait times in the emergency room. Wheatley said anyone who does not need urgent or emergency care should consider their private physicians or an outpatient service provider while the repairs are being done. He also said he's confident that the repairs will be completed as scheduled. All other services and inpatient areas in the hospital are fully operational, according to Wheatley. Turning our attention to crime, police are looking for a man in connection with a homicide in Bavoni. On Saturday, August 10th, around 7.30 p.m., police responded to a 911 call about a woman lying on the floor at a residence in Bavoni in the vicinity of the Purple Shop. When officers arrived, they found the woman lying unresponsive in, on the floor in what appeared to be a pool of blood. According to police, there was damage to the upper body of the unknown woman. EMTS confirmed that the woman had no vital signs. The victim's identity is being withheld pending notification of next of kin. Now, preliminary investigations prompted police to issue a wanted alert bulletin for this man, a Hispanic male known only as Antonio in connection with this homicide. Antonio is known to drive a blue Ford Escape. He is classified as armed and dangerous. If you see the man on your screen, you're urged to call police immediately. This matter is currently under active investigation. If you have any information, call the numbers on your screen, 774-2211, the Major Crimes Unit at 714-9830, or the Criminal Investigations Bureau at 714-9807. You can also contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or 911. Police are also investigating what appears to be an attempted kidnapping on St. John. On Saturday, August 10th, the police department responded to a call from victim Bernard Wesselhoff, owner of Slim Man Parking Lot on St. John. According to Wesselhoff, around 1.15 in the morning on Saturday, when he arrived at his residence in Enid, he parked his car across the street when he said an, an individual dressed in all black approached him from behind and put what he believed to be a gun to his head. The suspect told him not to look back he said, and forced him at gunpoint to the front door of his residence and ordered him to open the door. Wesselhoff was able to get away by pushing the individual, getting inside his house and locking the door. Wesselhoff said two gunshots were fired soon after. Officers were able to find a spent casing along with one round of ammunition at the scene. This matter is currently under active investigation. If you have any information, call the numbers on your screen. 774-2211, the Major Crimes Unit at 714-9830, or the Criminal Investigations Bureau at 714-9807. You can also contact Crime, Stop, Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or 911. Meanwhile, more arrests from the VIPD's traffic initiative checkpoints. On Thursday, August 8th, close to midnight, Officers arrested 23-year-old Dante Camille Joseph along Veterans Drive after stopping a black Nissan Altima that Joseph was driving. According to police, officers saw what appeared to be a glass jar containing marijuana in the back seat along with an unzipped backpack next to Joseph. Joseph reached for the backpack while police was asking questions, then refused to get out of his vehicle when ordered. Officers then removed Joseph from the vehicle at which point he spat at the officers and continued to act belligerently. Joseph is charged with throwing bodily fluid or waste at a person interfering an officer discharging of duties and simple possession. Police also arrested 26-year-old Kelsey Edwards and charged her with possession with intent to distribute. According to police, Edwards, who was driving a Jeep Cherokee, made an illegal lane change to avoid one of the traffic checkpoints. 
Officers pursued the vehicle and saw baggies of what appeared to be marijuana in the vehicle. Edwards admitted to smoking marijuana. According to police, officers also found baggies containing a white powdery substance that tested positive for cocaine. Edwards was placed under arrest and charged with possession with intent to distribute. Coming up next, updates on WAPA's undergrounding project, plus King of the Wing gives back to youth in the community. We'll be right back. The 10th annual King of the Wing held in June just made a large donation to Junior Achievement Virgin Islands. On Friday, August 9th, King of the Wing organizers Alpine Securities USVI and White Bay Group handed over a check worth $65,200 to the youth-centered organization. Junior Achievement VI teaches young people in the Virgin Islands about financial literacy, work readiness, and entrepreneurship. Its mission is to inspire and prepare young people to succeed in today's global economy. The King of the Wing contest took place on Saturday, June 15th on the shores of Megan's Bay Beach. It featured 34 competing teams and celebrity judge Drew Serza. This year, King of the Wing, in coordination with the Department of Tourism, will be sending Tosh Siwatu of Buddha Sushi Sake Bar and Grill to the National Buffalo Wing Festival this Labor Day weekend in Buffalo, New York. WAPA continues to make progress with the federally funded hazard mitigation projects. WAPA spokesperson Jean Griot provides more information regarding the underground projects for the territory. There's design uh, work being done, engineering work being done for that, um, for the undergrounding component of the hazard mitigation projects that are federally funded as part of um, long-term long -term and um, development for the electric system in the territory. The first feeder that's going to be uh, undergrounded will be the feeder on St. John, all of Cruz Bay up to the Myra Keating Smith Community Health Center will be undergrounded. Um, the design and engineering of that underground um, structure, the supporting facilities for the undergrounding of service on St. John is pretty much complete. And uh, the next steps will be, of course, to issue a request for proposals to go out and to identify a contractor and to select a contractor for that project. So St. John will be first to um, break ground with the undergrounding, and then on St. Thomas and on St. Croix, we're doing some engineering design work right now for the undergrounding of the various feeders. At the end of the undergrounding projects, and bear in mind that these are three- to five-year projects, up to 50% of our customers will have the opportunity to tie into their tie in their electrical service to underground facilities provided by the Water and Power Authority. So it's going to be a significant chunk of the aerial cabling that you that we're familiar with that's uh, going to be undergrounded, especially in the more densely populated areas. Um, just ju just looking at downtown St. Croix and portions of St. Thomas that are presently undergrounded in the aftermath of the 2017 hurricanes, we were able to restore service to customers that are fed in the underground services within one to two days after the storm's passage. So it's a significant you know, improvement. The underground systems obviously fare well, much up and running in Christiansted, St. Croix. A significant portion of the downtown area is underground. It is fed by underground service here on St. Thomas. Um, we pretty much uh, bring service to the airport to Vitima through underground circuits, as well as the um, Schneider Regional Medical Center. That's all on the underground circuits. And as a result of that underground that feeds the Schneider Hospital, many of the um, site streets also have facilities that benefit from the underground. As we head deeper into hurricane season, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is urging residents to be careful and watch out for storm surges. FEMA recently launched public service announcements and is releasing video public service announcements showing the deadly threats from storm surges. Storm surge is the abnormal rising of water generated during a hurricane or tropical system. When tropical systems cause a storm surge, more than 20 feet of water can be produced and pushed toward the shore, causing massive flooding. FEMA wants residents to follow local evacuation orders when tropical storms or hurricanes are forecast. Not taking action when state and local authorities issue evacuation orders can be deadly. NOAA is now predicting 10 to 17 named storms this hurricane season. For more information, you can go to www. 
ready.gov or www.fema.gov. The beloved Virgin Islands musician Clifton Finch received assistance from many friends and supporters this weekend in the form of an outdoor concert called Music Up For The Heart. Clifton, affectionately called Cliff, began experiencing severe chest pains, which turned out to be a heart attack, according to his friends. Cliff underwent open heart surgery in Puerto Rico and is recouping from surgery on the island's medical facilities. A GoFundMe campaign is nearly at its mark of $10,000, currently close to $9,000, has been raised to assist the musician. Cliff has been a musician for 50 years, playing a diverse range of genres with an emphasis on jazz. Spectacular performances in the genres of reggae and worship were heard in the Emancipation Gardens. So Yvette, on behalf of the Voices of Love, we'd like to make this presentation, this donation to you. Thank For you Clifton, so you're quite welcome, yes. all right? children playing with mommies and daddies it seems like such a simple thing but still it's hardly happening and some to scared to go outside because of all of them drivers and so the internet it take over the world wide web be my the master with technology it taking away your data my things just not get no better you bring back them good Stick around, your news to AccuWeather forecasts is coming up next. Well, as we take a look here across the Caribbean and notice here to the east, we are watching this system, that's Invest 96L. What you need to know about it is the fact that by the early week, it could potentially have some tropical development. And so we will be watching here very closely. Now, closer to home for tonight, we've got a wave that's pushing off uh, and that is heading on westward. And things are pretty quiet for tonight. We've got a partly cloudy sky, a temperature of 80 degrees. For tomorrow in St. John, a couple of spotty showers around, clouds and sunshine in 89. And in St. Thomas, some spotty showers around with a high temperature of 89, clouds and sunshine. St. Croix, same thing, 89, a couple of spotty showers. Taking a look at the marine forecast, the waves are at 2 to 4 feet tonight with an easterly wind of 10 to 15 knots. The Caribbean side, we're seeing the same thing, 3 to 5 feet for the wave heights, and we've got an easterly wind of 15 to 20 knots, so a little bit higher. Now, I mentioned Invest 96L. That's the concern. So we're tra tracking this tropical wave for this week, and as it heads westward into the weekend and early next week, it's generally going to be staying southward. Now, as it gets closer, there's two scenarios. If it rides a little bit farther northward, it's going to come into some areas of shear, and it will likely weaken for early next week. Never, nevertheless, though, we are going to see some downpours with it that we could expect for the early week. 
The other possibility is it heads westward uh, and a little bit farther to the south, coming into some open water, and there could be some development there. So our extended forecast here for Saturday, we've got a shower or two and a high temperature of 90 degrees, a stray shower around on Sunday at 89. Monday, a shower in spots, but by Monday night and Tuesday, that's when we could see some downpours as there could be some tropical development there with showers and thunderstorms. All right, thanks for that. Coming up next, News 2 Sports with Gary Anthony. Don't go away. I'm Gary Anthony and this is News 2 Sports. On Sunday, another milestone in the U.S. Virgin Islands sports world was made when FIFA President Gianni Infantino made the first ever visit of a sitting FIFA president to the U.S. Virgin Islands. The afternoon began at the U.S. Virgin Islands Soccer Association's new Bethlehem Soccer Complex with a Masters Tournament featuring soccer players 40 and up. After the tournament, President Infantino, Governor Albert Bryan Jr., CONCAF President Victorio Montegliani, VI Parks and Sports Parks and Recreation Commissioner Calvert White, President of the USVI Soccer Association Hillary Frederick, and Secretary of the USVI Soccer Association Lashanti Bailey and McDonald's Representative Yankee Kanturian took part in a ribbon cutting ceremony at the new soccer complex. President Infantino is pleased by what, he, by what has been accomplished and looks forward to a continued partnership with the U.S. Virgin Islands. I was thinking, well, this, this, this looks like paradise. It is paradise. It is paradise. <laughs> so as a soccer fan, yes, for me, in paradise, there is a soccer pitch somewhere. <laughs> so you can imagine my surprise when I land and I come over here and I see a soccer pitch. This is paradise. <laughs> yes. Really? This uh, field was built with the forward 1.0 funds. There was nothing here. And now there is something which is beautiful, which is state of the art. But state of the art not only for the governor said before for US Virgin Island. Not only for US Virgin Island. It's for the whole region. This is something that we can show and showcase to the world, really because it's something that has been built from scratch. We were discussing about maybe the possibility, I don't know if, they, if I can say this, in, in, in St. Thomas, uh, to have something like this. Uh, and then, of course, when it comes to this one here as well, to see what can we do more, what can we do better um, here as well, in terms of the stands and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think we need to, to realize that uh, if we work together, government, FIFA, CONCACAF and uh, US VI Soccer Federation, we can achieve a lot. Uh, we can achieve a lot not only for soccer but also for the community. For the I'll have more of FIFA President Infantino's visit later this week. And finally, congratulations to St. Thomas native Daryl Homer, who took home two gold medals for fencing at the 2019 Pan Am Games in Lima, Peru. Way to foil the competition. <laughs> That's it for sports. Allison, back to you. Thank you for that, Gary. And that's it for our show tonight. We're live on Facebook and YouTube and on VIA Channel 4 and 504, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Follow us on social media. Tag us on any stories you want to see on the news or send us a message on Messenger. You can also email us at newsdirector at tv2.vi. Thanks again for joining us on News 2. I'm Alison Bourne-Vanek. We'll see you next time.